All right. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, final uh, session for um, Father Norris Clark's uh, The One and the Many. And uh, tonight, uh, we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Fraser again to get, uh, present the, the culminating chapter that really just kind of ties it all together. So uh, with that, uh, Fraser, please take it away. Thank you, Brian. Um, welcome everybody. So we are looking at chapter 19 of uh, the one and the many, and it's called the great circle of being and our place in the universe. So as Brian pointed out, uh, Father Clark uh, kind of tries to give the, the kind of the ultimate or the finale for the book. So he's trying to bring everything he's said so far uh, and trying to come up with a synthesis for what this means for us in our day-to-day -day life uh, and how we think about God. And so this is, I think, probably the one place where he delves very specifically into Christian theology to some extent. Um, so I have my notes here on a notepad that I can share. Uh, is everybody able to see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, so the, uh, the main theme that Father Clark, Clark wants to get across uh, with this chapter is, is the idea that uh, this is a journey. So life is a journey uh, and specifically to put it in the terms that he's talked so far, it is a journey of the many to the one. Um, so one being the God. The God. Uh, and so the way that he says it is that the many is an outward journey from God. So to put it in Pauline terms, uh, God is like the source. Uh, he's the Alpha and the Omega. And so we start from God and then we proceed back on to God. Uh, so that is the basic idea uh, that he is uh, trying to, uh, first of all, get across with this, um, with this chapter. So he says, the ultimate journey of the many is to the one from which we have our existence. So he says that we have a, a built-in earning to go back to the source, to be united with, our, with, with the one, the good. And so it is very well reflected in St. Augustine's statement, our hearts are restless until they find the rest in thee. Um, and so Father Clark also points out why the circle was considered uh, the perfect circle, a perfect figure in the ancient world. Uh, and that is because it, when you draw a circle, we start at the same point and then we finish at the same point, right? So for so it's very much like the story of the universe itself, like everything proceeding from God and then going towards to God and finally communing with God or united with God. Um, so this is not, so, so this idea is not unique to uh, St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas borrows this from the Neoplatonist tradition, uh, Plotinus specifically, whereas the emanation uh, of, of the uh, emanation of the many is from the one. So in the um, in the in the Christian view, uh, this emanation uh, that is spoken of in the Neoplatonist tradition is translated as the self-communicating love of God. So you know, in a way, you can think of this as the kenosis, the self-emptying and the self-communicating of God's love. Uh, that's what brings the entire universe into existence, right? Uh, and he also, uh, uh, this is also reflected in a lot of stories in the ancient world where the journey of the hero, uh, right? So uh, this journey is supposed to specify the the metaphysical truth of everything emanating from God and then proceeding back onto God. Uh, so he makes this very crucial point that in a lot of mythologies, uh, 
this great metaphysical truth is is conveyed to us in in very understandable terms. Uh, this also makes sense, at least for me, of why a lot of people in the ancient world interpreted literature not just literally, but uh, as metaphorically and um, analogically pointing to something that is beyond the story itself. Uh, I made a small thought, which is like the way the Bard talks about Christology and Christ, uh, Christ's journey, the son of, journey of the Son of Man into the far country. Uh, and he's, he's drawing that from the, the, the prodigal son parable that Christ tells us. Uh, and moving from that point on, he talks about the role of humans in this journey. Uh, and so the uh, Clark is, in my opinion, he seemed very anthropocentric in his analysis. The, what, what he says is that because we are made of the smallest particle to the highest form of animal life and we're conscious of, of this whole journey, uh, we sort of have a priestly role in this world, uh, in our existence, that the the point of our existence is to is to bring all of creation uh, back to God. Uh, this is also something that it is an office that Christ Himself takes is the the priestly role is that He is mediating creation back to God, uh, and in a way we are also called to that office. Okay, and then He talks a little bit about arts and science. And because he's already made this observation that we journey, like we emanate from God and then move back uh, to God, all our science and all our exploration of the universe is so that we can call it back to God. So in a way it's, it's, it's mediating God to creation at the same time mediating creation to God. Uh, so he, he makes this observation that, so science becomes, science and art becomes both a humanistic endeavor as well as a potentially religious one. Um, and uh, he's also, he also reckons back to the Christian idea uh, that the journey is completed when we're transformed this from, from this timely existence to eternity and from this lowly matter uh, existence to the fullness of spirit. So having talked a little bit about um, the journey itself, Father Clark then goes on to say uh, that three things are to be trusted a truth from everything that we learned from this book so far, which is, uh, and the three, three truths are being is intelligible, and then uh, purpose of created universe, and then the universe as both gift and task for humans. So um, in all these things, he kind of summarizes what he's been talking about uh, throughout this book. So when he says being is intelligible, he, he recalls to the point when he said that all beings are created when, by an infinite mind and therefore they're rational and they can be understood, but they could never be understood as exhaustively because we don't have the infinite mind of God to exhaustively understand them. So at the core of every being is mystery. Uh, so it is impossible to uh, know other things exhaustively unless we know God fully, but then that is impossible because God is infinite and we are finite. And therefore we can, we can never know every other being exhaustively, but they are intelligible still. Um, and, and then he talks about the purpose of the created universe uh, and he, the, 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 the most definitive statement that he makes is that creation is better thought of as uh, a gift from the creator to living creatures. Here again, I think that he is a little bit anthropocentric because he calls back to the idea that we are rational and we are um, spiritually, emotionally, intelligent, intellectually are able to grasp being. Uh, and therefore we are called to give it back to God or present it back to God. Uh, and receive it from God as a, with a sense of gratitude because it's a gift. And then he makes this interesting point. He suggests that it'd be a waste of time for God to create a universe in which there are not beings that recognize his creation. And I thought maybe we could talk about that a little bit more during the discussion. 
and then he also says that um, uh, he, he also talks about how uh, our limited our limited essences uh, exist in the infinite act of God's existence. Uh, and so the, going back to the whole, uh, the most foundational question of philosophy, why is there anything at all? He answers it by saying that the mystery of being turns out to be the transcendent interpersonal love of God uh, that creates, sustains, uh, and calls us all back to God. Um, and then uh, it, there's one part where he talks about beyond metaphysics or like metaphysics and beyond. So what's, what's beyond metaphysics? And so when he talks about that, he says that science can really never answer the question of why. Uh, and so he says, if, if we end up taking a purely scientific uh, understanding of the universe, we will never be able to understand the why question of um, um, of of the universe. Uh, but he says, thankfully, there's metaphysics. And then shortly, he also um, talks about the limitation of metaphysics. So what he ends up saying is that we can draw these broader conclusions about uh, God and the universe. Uh, from a purely natural reasoning, uh, but to know more about God or to know more about um, uh, more about the mystery of being itself, we have to rely on revelation. Um, and, and history, which is which I thought was interesting how I mentioned that. Uh, but he, he ends up saying that metaphysics cannot answer all the questions that we have. We, we have to rely on God's communication or revelation to be able to uh, completely understand the mystery of, or not completely understand, but to get beyond just the, the, the basic conclusions that we draw from, um, draw from natural reason. So with that, uh, there ends my summary of the final chapter. Very good. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for that uh, excellent summary. Um, so, yeah, if anybody has any questions, reflections, uh, any, with regard, you know, specifically to the uh, chapter, uh, it's a good time to do that. And uh, after that, we'll open it out into a discussion about anything you want to talk about from the book, about metaphysics, or, you know, <laughs> the whole, you know. Could I, could I ask? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, 308, 309, uh, what, I mean, pretty sure Jess was discussing like three minutes ago, uh, talking about like the intelligibility of the, of being and so on. Uh, first off, do you guys know which text he has in mind from uh, Joseph Pieper? I, I, I must have missed it. I'm, I'm not catching it. Maybe he mentioned it earlier in the chapter and I, I lost. Um, but irrespective of which text that is, um, I, I was really struck by this. I'm, I'm trying to figure out like where's, where's the, what's the intellectual history of this, this idea here? I mean, I, I would have thought that this sounded very Hegelian. Um, but if this is like pre-Hegel, do you guys have uh, like a, a thread that we could follow prior to Hegel maybe uh, that captures this idea um, specifically that in order for you to understand something, you need to understand it completely. Uh, but the only way to do that is to be God himself. So you have to have some kind of connection to the mind of God. Uh, like, like, I, I've heard of that in Christian circles, but like, I don't think I've heard of that in Thomas before. I don't see much in the early modern period about this. So could somebody like give me a thread that goes pre-Hegel? Uh, Bonaventure and Saint and uh, was it Bonaventure and Nicholas of Cusa? I would say are the two big ones that I can think of off the top of my head. They uh, Nicholas of Cusa is actually sometimes called the uh, was it the medieval Hegel because so many of his ideas seem to prefigure 
uh, seemed to prefigure uh, Hegel's ideas. I, I can't remember the name of the text. I was literally just reading it today uh, from one of the links that Brian had posted, but it's like uh, something like the, the like the the, the the fool speaks of knowledge or something like that. It's, uh, it's it's some sort of supposed to be some sort of conversation between a scholar and some random person, and they have a discussion about what knowledge is. And it's also in one re kind of I, I wish I could remember titles, but he has another one where it's a dispute between a Christian and a pagan. And in both places, he brings up this idea that you have that we only can know universals. And then further from that, because we can only know universals, we can't actually know them in their completeness because they only exist in the mind of God. And then Bonaventure's journey to the mind of God, I believe, also has something about that. But it's been a while since I've looked at that. So anyone that's who knows Bonaventure better. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I thought that some of the argument that you were just giving uh, was in St. Augustine, too, uh, that in order to know anything, it has to be uh, something that can't uh, be altered, which is I mean, that goes back to Plato, but the idea that um, it has to be kind of exhaustive, uh, kind of like beating Mino's paradox uh, in Plato's dialogues, uh, that you have to have like your whole grasp around it. Otherwise, you can't call it knowledge. But the only way to get a whole grasp around it is to be exhaustive. Um, uh, but yeah, no, that's that's an interesting connection to make it to to Bonaventure because I. I I'm, I'm aware that Bonaventure has an illuminationist uh, understanding of epistemology uh, rather than a empiricist or rationalist or some other. Um, so that, that's, that's interesting. I, I would love to find what that text is from Bonaventure to see like the structure of the argument that you kind of just summarized really quickly. Um, I think it's journey to the mind. It's just called journey to the mind of God in English. Or there's there's a couple different versions of it. The one that I've seen is called Journey to the Mind of God. I saw, I think Brian has a version of it with a slightly different title. Okay. Yeah, yeah this is the, the uh, it's the soul's journey into God, or the I mean the, the Latin is itinerarium mentis in um, in Deum, I think. Um, but yes, no, that's that's uh, really a classic. Uh, there and I wonder if Eden was thinking for for uh, Cusanus maybe um, idiota de mente. That's <laughs> or, uh, it. That's the one. On Idiot. Mind. <laughs> yes, that's yes. the one. I was reading that this morning. Actually, I cannot believe I forgot the title. <laughs> what is it? Because uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. I, as a note, um, I was reading um, Stephen Gersh earlier. Where he was kind of talking about different strata in uh, Nicholas Accusa, right? Who, who in important ways, is drawing on <clears throat> the Albertist school, right? Little known fact, right? That that even after Thomas Aquinas, there were people who sort of followed uh, Albert the Great, um, and and of course that was kind of you know later becomes very important for certain uh, famous or infamous German Dominicans. Uh, but what Gersh was saying is that there's kind of a development in the phases of uh, Cuse's thought where, but I mean, the important thing, right, is I think a lot of it uh, comes from, it, there's sort of a lingua franca, right, of, of medieval Platonism, isn't there? Right? That, because you've got like, uh, texts like uh, Chalcidius's commentary on the Timaeus, you've got uh, stuff from uh, Boethius, and then Macrobius's commentary on the Dream of Scipio. Uh, and, and then another text that a lot of people were reading was the, um, the Asclepius uh, from the, uh, the Hermetica. Uh, the, the rest of it would become known in the Renaissance, but already, you know, I mean, Albert the Great commented uh, significantly on the Sleepius. Uh, and then, uh, but, but Cusa was, he, like he started finally to have access to very extensive, because um, they were starting to have actual, you know, uh, Plato's dialogues finally in Latin translation. And so then in his later works, he delves much more, especially into, uh, you know, the, the Parmenides, including Proclus's commentary on Parmenides, and, Proclus's uh, 
on the sophiology. Oh, the so the German Dominic. I'm thinking of like, of course, Meister Eckhart, and then Tauler Suso and his school drawing on this other fascinating figure called the Bertold of Musburg. And there's been a couple of uh, monographs and essays on him recently, as as well as on the way that many of these high medievals started drawing on a book called the Liber de Causis or the Book of Causes, which until very recent, many scholars just kind of thought, it, oh, it's well, it's like a just pieces lifted from Proclus's elements of theology, but that's now considered very simplistic, and it actually, uh, and the fascinating thing, and I'm sorry, I, I'm kind of taking it on an aside, but I'm just intrigued by all this. Uh, Albert the Great, this was like one of the, the most important texts that permeates his entire uh, corpus from which you derive a metaphysics of flow. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm probably not answering your question in a very specific way, but I've did, there's a lot of stuff kind of um, in the um, cir intellectual circulatory system. This is a bad mixed metaphor of, <laughs> of the high middle ages. And uh, so I, somewhere in there, I'm, I'm sure you, 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 you'll find something of that nature, but it it is clear to me that, as you say, right, I mean, um, you know, Norris Clark is very much a Platonizing Thomist, um, even if he kind of will juxtapose, you know, the Platonic view as this, or Neoplatonic view also as this, this other, but I think in important ways, you know, he's, he is also a Platonist, um, just as, you know, just as Aquinas himself was also a Platonist. It, it, and of course, that's a dichotomy that, you know, like everybody was assuming that Aristotle and Plato were not in essential conflict, which I tend to, I think that is legitimate. Welcome, Kevin. Hey. Ke Kevin, maybe Hi. you know, because because Kevin, you 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 studied with Clark. That's this. So this is awesome. Jonathan, maybe maybe Kevin might remember something about this. OK. I could repeat the question. Is that sure? I don't know how you do need to hear it here because I did. I wasn't on. Oh man, uh, I was really hoping that you'd just be like, "Oh, I came in and was able to catch up." No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so uh, the there's a portion of Clark, uh, page three hundred eight, three hundred nine, where he's talking about needing to know the whole in order to know any of the parts. And so all of the parts are intelligible to God, but not to us. There's some mystery to it, uh, at least in, insofar as you need to know it fully. And yeah, okay. I, I was thinking, wow, that sounds pretty Hegelian. And I was thinking, but there's got to be some, some hint of this prior to Hegel. Hegel didn't invent that idea. Um, so could we follow a thread, uh, the line of argument prior to Hegel? that was trying to make the case that you need to have exhaustive knowledge or to have any knowledge, A, and then for, for what Clark has said, I mean, some Hegelians after Clark, uh, after, um, before Clark, but after Hegel, uh, have tried to make similar claims that you need to have your mind somehow, you know, involved in or participating in like the, or in some deep connection with the mind of God in order to have any claim of knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh so so what is that going to look like and so they pointed to to bonaventure you know the illumin illuminationist tradition uh going back to augustine uh but was and nicholas of Cusa. uh did, did you mm -hmm. have others that would come to your mind uh or specific arguments or specific texts um i wish i had i mean the this I would probably want to um check the uh hold on one second because I've got unpaid I'm on page 308 there's a, a bunch of texts but it says there are references to the great circle of being in St. Thomas um and I guess that's probably from what he was saying before so yeah and then there's nothing after this that talks about how um we we know things but only God knows them thoroughly um so um yeah, I mean, I know there's there's some text in in the vast corpus of Thomas's works, and I'm sure in the Summa. Um, 
where he where he'll where you can find a quote that just like is like a perfect little gem of that. And I just don't know it offhand, where it basically says that, you know, um we know things by their forms, so we know what we know what they are, but we don't know them the way God knows them. So we don't know them thoroughly. There's still some mystery there. Um, so I'm trying to think offhand. That I mean, was actually that, that was, was going to be part of my question. Was like I don't remember any of this sort in the, in Aquinas. Oh, it's um, there. No, he says that. He says that explicitly. I just can't remember where. Okay. Um, and. Uh, Akuzanus is also very is also a very good um, source for that, but I mean I would have to I would have to dig to try to find it. I don't I know it I, it's not in Clark's book, but there's like I think Lonergan uses it, um, but again that's a bit, that's also a vast <laughs> body of work to 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 you know to sift through to find one single quote. Um, but uh, that's, that's basically the that's basically the basis of the transcendental Thomism. That uh, there's this um, uh, link to Kant in uh, Aquinas by the way he uh, talks about how we know things, um, which is you know you know to a, you know to a degree we don't we, we're not we're not stuck in the we're not stuck in the phenomena we know the noumena but we don't know the fullness of the noumena you know we don't we don't know it things the way god know knows them we know them though not just like you know representations in our minds that we project we know the things themselves but not necessarily fully in themselves if you understand what i'm saying but it's uh yeah i wish i, I wish i had um I wish I had, uh, you know, at the, t at the tip of my tongue, you know, a, a reference to, to something in either the Summa or one of the sentences or one of his quad libido questions, something yeah, like that. But Kevin, why don't you have encyclopedic knowledge I am sorry. on demand? <laughs> you know, you know what it's reminding me of too, by the way, though, uh, right? And in connection to, um, hello, Samuel, and this thing about uh, divine illumination and uh, it reminds me also of, of uh, Nicholas uh, Malabranche's um, doctrine of knowledge, which is kind of an extension of that. And I don't want to equate them because he had his own particular way, obviously, right, as somebody who was very Cartesian, right? No, it's, isn't it? If, if I understand it yeah. correctly, which is not entirely likely, but he, he thinks that God and divine ideas are the first object of our intelligence, that's right. right? That's right, that's right. That's ontology. Intuition of God precedes knowledge, uh, other knowledge. Um, that's, that's correct. And this is mm -hmm. continued in some way by uh, uh, Rosemead, isn't that right, Kevin? Yeah, but in a very, very mitigated way. There was another one of his companions whose name of brain farting, and I can't remember him, but he was much more the ontologist then you know like roast meaning was was kind of lumped in with him but those two they were friends but they they also had uh, some bitter um you know argument all the bitterness was on the other side roast meaning was never bitter but they it, it got heated between them because um the other guy was like to roast meaning can't you just go the rest of this way and he's like no because the, the rest of the way that you in, where you go is not orthodox like i'm drawing the line where it belongs and you're on the other side of it um but yeah because rossini he was saying that, that well we don't we don't know god in him you know his reality uh, as the first object of our intellect what we have is the um the idea of being and it's an abstraction but it's divine abstraction from what god is so it's still it's still divine in its own way it's still god in its own way but it's God's idea of himself that he implore, impl implants in our soul. Whereas um, what ah, his name, it begins with G, I can't remember it, but what that guy in the Malabranch was saying was that what God puts is like this little proto beatific vision in our, in our minds, in our, you know, as the first object of our intellect. Uh, we, what we get is a, a little part of God, but we get his, his essence a bit a bit is reality the reality but and Rosmini was like no we can't go there that's not orthodox we just get an ab an abstraction an idea and uh, saint thomas says that we have that idea but he said he thinks that 
that we get it, we abstract it from the from the world by from beings by by having mental contact with beings and then eventually abstract the idea of being. And Rosmini was like, no, we couldn't even get the idea of being that way. Would we, we, we putting the car? He's putting the car before the horse respectfully, because you know, Rosmini had no utmost respect for Thomas, but he was like, not quite right on this. Right. So it, it seems like there are a couple of fault lines here, isn't it? That that uh, I, I mean, so I mean that. But to Fraser, the uh, di divine illumination right is is sort of related to Augustine's presentation of Christ the teacher that in some way all knowledge is through the logos, right? I I mean when you come to know when you come to know something, uh, it, it is the logos illumining uh, your mind, it's right? Like There's the, it's like the C.S. Lewis phrase the god is like the sun you can't look at the sun but without the sun you can't look at anything else mm -hmm. so yes god he's kind of illuminates everything and right makes he, he's possible he, he's that by which we know or uh you know i mean dionysius would present god as that by which you know all things come to light the theophanically all right mm -hmm. and and i think what it would you know what some people would would be concerned about is because they might have us this idea. Well, we want to have like natural, right? Natural knowledge and kind of coordinate off in some way from, you know, divine, divinely given knowledge or revelation, right? Like how they're worried that it's going to kind of. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. How, but so that that's what I was questioning is like the whenever he talked about this is natural reason and this is like, uh, this is you know revelation. Can we really separate them? right because if for, from one standpoint anything that we know is a sort of a revelation right it, it's it's god illuminating that knowledge to it so is it fair to even say or differentiate between oh this is where natural reason can lead us to and then we have to rely on uh wouldn't it be wouldn't it be more consistent to say everything we know about even with like our natural reason is in some way revealed I, I think it could could be fair. I mean, maybe one example, right? So if I understand, and I, I'm not, I don't recall what Thomas's arguments are, but for example, you know, for somebody like Aquinas, you can know that, it, you know, God's simplicity and many things about God, but you can't know, for example, Trinity, right? Or mm -hmm. you can't know the identity of Christ. You can't, you know, there, there is that which you can know about God without revelation. And there's that which only revelation can disclose to you. Now, there, but there have always been figures who said, on the contrary, Trinity is woven in the fabric of creation. It's and so, of creation, right? So, one, the, and uh, I mean, Cusanus is one of them, uh, but, but many uh, philosophers, particularly those who kind of were contemplating the Trinity and kind of, uh, you know, the uh, number, right? Uh, partially in inspir Pythagorean inspiration, they would say that. On the contrary, uh, and 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 of course, where you really get the you know non non Christians can discern at least in some inchoate way the Trinity. It, it's just they, they said it's there. Look, Proclus knows the Trinity. <laughs> um, and but you know you see what some people would kind of be like you know, but it's it's a debate, right? The, these were all, I, I think these were legitimate positions that were aired and arguments were brought but i mean does somebody have a sense of like what would aquinas say why why would he say no we we, we actually can't know say the trinity or or other certain aspects of the christian god through uh reason well i think aquinas um he I think he was definitely interested in drawing certain lines and, and certain, making certain distinctions uh, to keep certain um, orthodox uh, pronouncements, you know, sacrosanct and undisputed. Um, but there's some there's some leeway there. I mean, if you're if our idea of knowledge itself is that it's to some degree divinely revealed, like it's illumination. I mean, that Augustine. Um, talk like that and Aquinas um, uh, takes takes on that, some of that too. But then what 
what we would what we would say to remain or still still stay on the orthodox line would be to say that you know although all knowledge is generally revealed some things require special revelation and that without special revelation we either couldn't know it or we would if we came to know it um we so like I don't think that there's a um, a hard rule against saying that we could, in light of special revelation, look at what is uh, revealed to reason alone and see it sort of like, you know, sort of back engineer your way into it, you know, um, so you so that, in you know, knowing where to look, you could say, oh, yeah, I could see that being is triune. OK, you know, in the light of this other. Um, but in light of this revelation, I can look at I can look at being and say, okay, I can see this trinitarian structure. Yes, I think one way they did that was to, you know, just in in the act of cognition, they found a triune structure of of the way that, um, and I I can't I don't know if the top of my head, but in some way that that the knower and that which is known, right, and and kind of that knowing it, it's framed in such a way that they say, you see there, there is actually uh, in, in a similar way to kind of arguments that were made why, I mean, Cusa says that the Trinity is already implicit in divine simplicity. Uh, that if you know the divinely simple God, then reasoning to the Trinity from that just flows naturally. From, and and um. I suppose not everybody who adhere, you know, who adheres to divine simplicity would say that, but he he does argue that. Um, and um, let's see. Well, one of the um, one of the things that Aquinas would would uh, talk about when he says what we can and can't know, he's he's talking about knowing in a certain strict way, like what we could demonstrate. Like um, he would probably agree with Richard, Richard of St. Victor that we can speculate that there, it was available to reason to speculate uh, and, and sort of grasp the possibility of the Trinity being, you know, one possible uh, and, you know, uh, ultimate truth, uh, but not to be able to demonstrate that this is actually how it is. Like it would just be available as a possibility. Um, so I can't, I can't really speak to Aquinas or anything, but I thought that one interesting parallel was in, uh, yeah. to, to what you mentioned, Brian, which it's in Trika Shaivism, um, yeah, Hinduism. or Kashmiri Shaivism, which is this concept of Triputi Pacha Kasavada, which is this, this trinity of knower, known, uh, and knowledge, or sorry, uh, the knower knowing and uh, the object of knowledge and uh, that they're all uh, uh, kind of non-dual fundamentally and that that non-dual reality is divinity itself or the recognition of divinity. And uh, anyways, but and then prior you're asking uh, why can't we come to sort of revelation through rational thought or um, what was the, you didn't say rational thought, but through uh, well some process of rationalization, and I can't speak to Aquinas, but I would say that the the, the inevitable problem is uh, perhaps from a, a a spiritual perspective is that um, uh, any process of of rationalization or reasoning leads itself to some sort of um, object or a conditioned object of that rationality or that reasoning and that being a conditioned object of thought itself cannot be you could say uh the the recognition of that which is unconditioned if that makes sense just pulling in my my knowledge of eastern philosophy here <laughs> but um anyways that was just a a, 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 a perhaps a, a pass of 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 approaching that question yeah, that's true. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting parallels in Hinduism, uh, the way that Brahman is manifested in three different uh, small g gods uh, can also be very parallel to uh, 
obviously there are differences. But I think the question I was asking was the opposite. I wasn't asking, you know, can you get from natural knowledge to like revealed knowledge, but why isn't every fact we know sort of, because I'm, I'm uh, in my mind, I'm at least thinking a lot of Catholic theology draws this distinction between this is nature and this is grace. But what if we collapse that and say all of it is grace? Right, that's that's where I'm coming from. So, like when I when I know something about a being and not God, how is that not how is that not revealed? You know, does that make sense? That question. I think I think it does. Uh, the the hard line, the hard nature and grace distinction is really a product of um, sort of twentieth century. Thomism, uh, and it, it really it, it ceased to be um, really that that important uh, it, right around when Vatican II started. Um, it's there's there's still you're going to still find some you know practitioners of it, and for a while I was I was very much a uh, um, enthusiastic uh, student of that old form of Thomism, but um, uh, it's, I, I think now there's more of an emphasis on, um, instead of drawing hard lines between where nature is, ends and grace begins, uh, it's more of a, it's, it's a little bit less exact and it's a little bit more like what I was saying earlier, that it's all grace, it's all revelation, but some, uh, some revelations are more, are more special and occasion centered whereas the and the rest of them are sort of you know pervasive and uh, always uh, always present so they don't they're just they've always been part of what we're they're, they're what the 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 knowledge that we swim in you know on our consciousness you know there there's um and, and i i definitely sure. am prone not to see a super stark distinction between nature and grace however even you know, those old Baroque Thomists, right? The people that, uh, you know, get, get dumped on quite a lot. Uh, it's very interesting because if you look at what they say about the possibility of somebody being saved through invincible ignorance, you look closely and, and what do they say, right? They, they say that suppose there is, there is a person, right? Um, I, I, I need to, gosh, I need, I need to, figure out which one particularly. I, I think I think they were drawing on something in Thomas himself and then kind of making it more explicit. But um, the School of Salamanca, I think, really did you know, develop the idea of invincible ignorance more explicitly because they were faced with, well, gee, there really are whole regions of the world where people are unacquainted with Christianity at all, right? Which they, they didn't know. I mean, previously, maybe some people might've assumed, right? That everybody had heard the gospel you know, any, which is kind of hard to, to imagine, uh, but, but it, it reinforced the realization that no, I mean, a lot of people simply just, so, so essentially what, what they said was, you know, let's say that there is somebody who believes, who adheres to providence, right, or who, who sees the workings of the divine law, I'm sorry, the, of, of the natural law, who, you know, believes in God, right, believes that all things are given from God, Right. And there is this order, this harmony to the universe, shall we say. Right. Which many, many people did. Right. In all different cultures. You know, they were thinking maybe especially of the uh, pagan philosophers. But but by analogy, it, there's a vast swath of humanity who says, yes, no, I, I believe that there is a divinely given order. And, you know, I I, you know, and, and they practice virtue and, and they're they have their faith. And so what, what they said was such a person, right, not merely through, because of God's mercy, but because of God's justice, right? They would say this one is, is, right, that person has a dignity, right? And so God will give them a special revelation. God will, God, God will send through, through an angelic, uh, right, uh, they, they, they will be visited by an angels, right, pure intellect, right? They'll receive, uh, and they will attain salvation through that, 
God, God's justice will not allow him to deny such a person the beatific vision. John, maybe a question for you is um, it, like a lot of Van Tilian thought seem to fall sort of under this category, right? So would you say that like whatever he was saying was uh, very much in like in the Thomas tradition, like because he talks a lot about ref, like epistemology. So uh, Van Til, uh, <clears throat> Van Til says he disagrees with Thomas a lot, but he misunderstands Thomas and a lot of I think things he, that he says. I think, I think he misunderstands everybody. I, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, that might be true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when I was reading this, though, uh, I was just like, uh, could Van Til say every single sentence in this except the stuff about Peeper because he, he wouldn't know Peeper? Uh, I mean, I, I thought he could, but like, I feel like that's despite Van Til. Uh, so just in case other people are not familiar, Cornelius Van Til was writing uh, mid 1900s. Uh, he was uh, Dutch reformed. He went to Calvin College and then went to Princeton Seminary and then became faculty at Westminster. And he is known for his epistemology, which is called presuppositional apologetics. Uh, which says like nobody can know anything unless they have a Christian Holy Spirit union uh, union with God. Uh, and so he's going to say anybody who's not a Christian, they have knowledge, but they also don't have knowledge. So it's he gets confusing. But I mean, like right here, uh, Clark says like all these all creatures therefore have a certain depth of mystery are known hyphen unknown to us now. Van Til is gonna say that for everything, uh, especially for the non-Christian. Uh, anybody who's not a Christian, uh, evidence, they're going to have uh, you know, the common world that God has made, but they are ultimately not gonna know anything because they're disconnected from the anchor. Uh, which is God. Uh, they're they're not trying to understand the world as God sees it, but creatively reinterpreting it. These are these are phrases that are like commonly repeated by Van Til and others. Um, but like this this notion, I, I was I was thinking of part of this was Hegelian is like Van Til is soaking up Hegel. Uh, he says he's not a Hegelian. He's critiquing Hegel, but I mean, so much of it's just Hegel. Uh, but uh, some of the stuff that he's talking about is like there's going to be no accounting for knowledge unless you have your mind in kind of like incoherence with the divine mind, which has a full exhaustive knowledge of all things. Uh, you don't have an exhaustive knowledge, but you can be coherent with the divine mind. Uh, so I, I, I read this passage, and I'm just like, wow, could Van Til say all these things? Uh, maybe, but uh, not with justification that Clark does. Uh, so I, I didn't know. I, and I was just thinking there's no way that Van Til and Hegel were the only ones, uh, which was part of why I was asking this. Uh, does, that, does that answer your question, Fraser? Because I, I felt like it was, I'm not gonna ask a Van Til question, I'll ask a Hegel question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. yeah it does it does answer that question uh i, I think he's overly overrated uh i don't like which one hegel or van til because like so nobody awesome. knows van til no hegel, hegel is great uh we won't have we oh <laughs> uh, no but van til though I, I i read his books and i was like very disappointed because i thought like he was like taking on um monism and i thought wait what what no this is <laughs> this is not true like you're not you're not even understanding what you're critiquing before you're you're like critiquing it so anyway yeah just, i so i have a bone to pick with van til and and it's clear that, that you do too but uh unlike a pile of the things that have been thrown in the chat uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody read Fantel 
if you're going to get anything that's good in Van Til, you can get it in Herman Bovink. You can get it in uh, John Murray. You can get it in uh, Aquinas. Just go to better sources who write better and are less vitriolic uh, and caustic, which Van Til is very, very acidic. So uh, he's not charitable to people he disagrees with. So uh, don't waste your time with Van Til or John Frame or Scott and Elephant who follow after him. I, I can make 10 friends who would be very upset with you right now for saying that. I mean, John Frame has plenty of good things, but not, not epistemology or philosophy. Uh, uh, Eden, I agree. As a side note, I, it, it seems to wow. me that a, a lot of, um, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I'm just saying you shouldn't have any Calvinists in here because they'll get really, really irritated. <laughs> oh. Uh, by the way, I am a Calvinist. <laughs> oh, it's great, it's great. <laughs> uh, without apology. So, uh, well, I mean, um, Fentel is pretty much. I mean, I think he's a he's an idiot. Um, Thanks. We're all on record. Thank you. Thank you. Oh no! Oh no! I, I like this is being recorded. Everyone is now put in their vote. Fentel. Well, I mean, presuppositional uh, apologetics is just stupid. I mean, you you start. That they say all arguments need to be circular. In other words, you need to become essentially illogical to become logical. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, a guy like R.C. Sproul, he, he knows that, that that's just crap, and so he, <laughs> he just warns <laughs> reformed people not to say the kind of stuff that Vantel says. I mean. I mean, Van Tol is kind of, I mean, he's almost as bad as Bonson. Anyone like Bonson? Um, don't, don't read it. Don't, don't, don't read it. I mean, what do you mean? Like Bonson, Bonson, but not Van Til. How can you like Bonson, but not, not Bonson? Bonson. <laughs> I, uh, um, I mean, they're, they're the same okay, to me. Okay, okay. Uh, they're the same thing to me. You essentially need a positive that God is not the good, but God is the ultimate monster. And then, yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I, I shouldn't rant. I, I, I didn't read this book, so I shouldn't rant. Um, yeah, any, anyways, Brian was saying something. Oh, well, so, all right. Um, I, I'm trying to remember also, didn't Luther get brought up earlier for some reason? Um, I brought and... him up before we started recording. Okay, yes, yes. And, and you might have seen- But I think you I... mentioned, uh, was that the Dominican you were referring to of some unsavory German Dominicans being picked up? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, well, so, I mean, there's a whole interesting story about how, you know, early in his, early on, he was actually very fond of the Theologica Germanica. So he, he did draw in some of those German Dominicans early on. So it kind of, um, I mean, it's much more than that, but a kind of Dionysian mysticism via people like Eckhart, Tauler, Suso, and you know, kind of that. And then he kind of turned away in, 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 ho in horror, you know, but not, not really in, in some way, because I'm about to say something good about Luther, Samwell. So just, okay, <laughs> I, believe it or not, yes. Now I did post that thing where I, I said, you know, like like where you're saying like math is just is just evil and the enemy of theology. Uh -huh. was kind of like, but but no, the, the good thing, see, there is this math element in physical mix. There is this element in his thought, which is, I mean, it's is an inheritance from before him, but it's it's like he stresses the omnipresence of God, right? In, in some of his hymns and in some of his writings in ways that that lend themselves surprise you know to a kind of mysticism where and i think in lutheran tradition like like god's body is everywhere right right be through christ it, it's it's there's 
I don't usually hear it emphasized, but th there's this way that it, uh, you know, it's, it, it becomes more explicit in people like Jakob Böhme, right, in the later uh, Lutheran uh, tradition. Um, but, but it's there in Luther, it, 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 and, it, and it kind of, um, and it's, and it, but it's, it's not mediated um, it, 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 hierarchically, I think. It, it's just there's a, this direct presence in some way of God to, to, to everything, uh, which, which there can also be if you have a more kind of platonic hierarchical view of the cosmos. But, but Luther stresses that, that divine immediacy in, in some places in, in ways that, but I, want, I wonder like in some way like that, I, it, maybe like, it's like a game of telephone where you kind of, that, that kind of gets thinned out and you don't see it as much in, in modern Protestant theology, although sometimes you do, but I think there are figures who try to bring out that kind of, um, some very interesting concepts of God, but I, I don't know the literature hardly at all. I'm sure some of you know it very well. I, I found a quote that is interesting about um, Aquinas and knowledge that um, was going um, um, goes back to um, what we were talking about, where he uh, would affirm that there's some kind of mystery that we don't know things thoroughly. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have the exact reference, but I, but um, the Thomistic Institute uh, website is quoting him as saying, "Our manner of knowing is so weak." that no philosopher could perfectly investigate the nature of even one little fly. So, I mean, that's, the, that's one of the, I remembered that quote now as being one of the things that, um, that hit me as uh, sort of um, more friendly to Kant than um, uh, I had been led to believe. I'm thinking of um, sort sort of the, the the different faculties by which one can know, right? And it, uh, I I, th I think if you're very Aristotelian, you think all knowledge begins with the senses, right, and is abstracted from the senses. Uh, but of course, th there were always uh, figures who um, you would challenge that. Um, you know, who, who would say that, no, there, there's, um, uh, but let's see, if I remember correctly, it's like you have the senses and then you have imagination and then you have reason and then you have intellect is, it, I think was kind of the usually shared um, hierarchy of faculties of knowledge in, in the middle ages. And so, so basically, if, if, if you are really stridently Aristotelian, you would think that you have to draw from the senses and then ascend upward from them, uh, 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 at least, I guess, in natural reason. Whereas presumably, right, if, if you're receiving divine grace, right, it's descending. It's, uh, and I th think the question is whether that also can happen outside of the visible church and its sacraments, right? That, that's kind of the where you know you start to um, because because obviously it's 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 also a political thing right it's part of what the church the church's stance vis-a-vis -vis the secular right nature perfects grace also means right that uh, the secular can't do it on its own kings and princes and right uh, they 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 can't do it on their own they they need that mediation of divine grace through, through the church. Um, so that's definitely a, a big, a big part of it. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not necessarily usually prone 
it's interesting though, like you could you could read it so much in such very different ways. Uh, that kind of who who was it who said that in a way there's there, it's like Christ claims cl there's no domain that that Christ doesn't claim and say mine, right? What, who said that? It was like it was one of these presuppositional. Kuiper. Kuiper. Abraham Kuiper. Kuiper. Yes, and not a square inch of the universe which Christ does not claim is mine. And it is, and I think there's a way of reading that that I would agree to, and and maybe other ways that I wouldn't. We all stop talking, chat, chat, chat. <laughs> well, you know, I mean. Still on. Um, what do we make of the anthropocentric nature of what Clark is saying here? Uh, that was an aspect that kept coming up because he, he, he kept telling us like, we're, we're the most intelligent, you know, we're supposed to draw all the creation back to God and so on and so forth. But it seems to suggest that like a lot of what we know from scientific studies now seem to suggest that animals are also conscious. They, they do have language, so on and so forth, right? Um, so how do, what, what implication does that have uh, in terms of the way that we understand um, our theology? Um, what, what do you mean by, what do you mean by that? I mean, consciousness doesn't seem like it's that difficult. Like to imagine like a dog has phenomenal experience, uh, but like self-consciousness, like self-concept, or do you mean something else? Right. I think I'm, uh, I mean more of the phenom phenomenological aspect of it. Like dogs are aware. Yeah. I don't think they're self-aware. Um, but does that have any implication at all, to, you know, um, in terms of how we, because it seems like he, he's suggesting that they don't worship God or they are not aware of, of God's presence. Uh, that to me seems, that doesn't sit real well with me. Well, I, I mean, uh, don't, don't the Psalms speak of all things praising him, right? Uh, you know, whether, but they don't do it, you know, we, we, I'm thinking of, and Sam will know. Well, where 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 have we gotten that idea that everything is everything praises him? Uh, I think that's a, oh, I see. <laughs> um, no, I sorry, I thought he was referring to what I said. Um, no, like so they do, they do in fact. That is true. Um, no, um, but th but then uh, there's this lovely hymn where they it says and and birds their artless notes did sing in anthems to the heavenly king. And, and so it, it's, it's artless praise, whereas, whereas our praise is artful, right? We're, we're, we're self-aware, it's, it's a conscious thing, right? And, and so we, we don't just do it only by our nature, but in some way it, it's, it's, it's given to us by grace to do it in a more explicit way, uh, rather than simply praising God ontologically through our existence. Um, but, there's a way that that creatures also participate in, in that right so it it's i think you can have that distinction you're not you know you're not saying that animals are not conscious at all certainly right uh but you're you are you do want to maintain a distinction in a sense because there's a different maybe clark would say in humans it vibrates at a a greater intensity of of consciousness something like that right um and and you know, there's definitely a kinship, right? I mean, I, I, I don't know why I always think of this Bonaventure quotation where he says that as a human, and it's not just him, right? He, I mean, he's echoing what I think kind of would have been pretty much a consensus view among many figures that, you know, as a human being, Christ has something in common with all creatures. With the stone, he shares existence. With plants, he shares life. With animals, he shares sensation. And with the angels, he shares intelligence. Um, 
Thus, all things are transformed in Christ, since in his human nature, he embraces something of every creature in himself when he is transfigured. And, and, and so we can say anthropocentric, but it, it doesn't mean that humans are in a, it, we don't have to think of it as dominance necessarily. I think, I think often, unfortunately, it's, it's interpreted as, as dominance, right? Which, which it doesn't have to be. Uh, human, humans are a central sort of being, right? We're, we're lower, a li- lower than the angels and, and you know, higher, higher than, right? We're, we're, we're middling, right? But because of that middlingness, right? We can ascend and we can descend and we can, I guess, kind of, <laughs> you know, float, um, kind of just, I was going to say tread water, but again, I was talking about air and then treading water doesn't, you know, but, but, uh, but that is the, I mean, it sounds like you're pointing to there, right? The scandal of particularity, right? Like, why should it be human beings, right? Why, why should Christ be a man? Why should, why any of it? Like, why <laughs> are we that special, you know? And, and, you know, I, 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 I don't think, I'm not really drawn to the view that it's all just arbitrary and, and, and random that uh, if all, if, if all of this should be true through arbitrariness and randomness, that would be even more astonishing. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, does that speak to where you're coming from or, or... It, it does it does uh to some extent at uh, one point he actually makes this point that he says that god would have wasted time if there was no intelligent um being to be able to worship him and like give praise to god for it right to me that is that sounds very uh i don't know kind of arrogant in a way um it's like I, I can make things that don't have to like worship me back again. It, it doesn't, it doesn't. If, uh, I also, it raises the question of, for me, can God waste time? But even more, it makes me want to read from the <laughs> real Bible, the Catholic one, one of my very favorite passages. And I think this maybe speaks to your uh, anthropocentrism too. If, if I may, uh, the, the song of uh, Daniel's friends in the furnace which I, I think is great to really read this allegorically too, as uh, um, like in the fire of uh, questioning, but uh, the, and here with the angel, so this intelligible being, but the angel of the Lord went down to the furnace with Azariah and his companions, drove the fiery flames out of the furnace, made the inside uh, as though a dew laden breeze were blowing through it. The fire in no way touched them and caused them pain or no pain or harm. Then those three began to glorify Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestors, praiseworthy and exalted forever. And I'll cut up to the, uh, the key parts here. Um, blessed are you in the firmament, praiseworthy and glorious forever. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord, praise and exalt him forever. Angels of the Lord, bless the Lord. And they go through all the waters of the heavens, bless the Lord, uh, and so on. Sun and moon, bless the Lord. Stars in heaven, bless the Lord. Every shower and dew, bless the Lord. All you winds, bless the Lord fire and heat, bless the Lord, cold and chill, bless the Lord, and so on. But uh, to me, that's a, a, a soothing balm uh, from the real Catholic Bible. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean by real Catholic yeah. Bible? Time out, time it's out. Tongue time out. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 what, what, what does that even mean? It's in, it's in it's Catholic Bible, a... but it's not in Protestant ones. So you have to look up, uh, if you want to find that section of Daniel. Okay, well, so so yeah. which one is the real Catholic Bible? Because you do know that everyone in communion with the Pope don't have the same canon. So, I mean, I, that that's just a nonsensical claim from the onset. It's so not true, and it can even make sense, even if you want it to make sense. I, I, so it's just, what, it's yeah. the one that he has. That's that's it. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, worth I, under, I, 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 it's worth I'm just... noting that my tongue is planted firmly in my cheek fabric. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, think, I, I, I just think, uh, I think, yes. So oh, the, sorry, the, the, I just the, I, I just kind of yeah. I I, I think the the, the the notion that everything worships God, right? I I think that that's what I have to do with the way that Father Clark articulates it. Because I'm not I'm not saying that we're we're just randomly here. I mean, obviously there's a purpose to it, but I'm I'm saying like you know when when you know when dinosaurs were around, God wasn't like ah oh, man, I'm really bored. The humans aren't around to worship me, you know. 
he he makes it sound like it. <laughs> well, um, I mean, let me speak to that for a second, because I I'll just I'll just tell you what I was getting out of that when I read that and when I was hearing him a lecture about that. My thought that it was that he where he was getting at was this: uh, an agent acts towards an end that is a good, there's a benefit. Something benefits, someone benefits, okay? And if God created um, a universe without agents that could, um, that were self-aware and could uh, appreciate being and appreciate being made by him um, and you know, experience that as a benefit, experience that as a joy, understand that. It would be very odd to do because God doesn't benefit from that either. So what benefits? What what who what's what would be experiencing that as a good? Who benefits from God creating a, a universe without a kind of worshiping agent? And I, that's how I took it. I was like, yeah, there'd be no I, there'd be really no motivation to create at all. If there weren't some really good um, end for uh, creating the, you know, otherwise God wouldn't do it because he can't benefit. He's already perfect. So some, there's got to be something that benefits or else he wouldn't do it. And that's how I took it. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That makes sense. You know, I, I, oh, go ahead. I'm going to say something. Can you hear me? Fine? Yep. All right, cool. No, I just wanted to pick up things uh, that um, Kevin was saying about motivation, the goal to motivation. So I wanted to link that to the, the passage, which is just yet another, probably, thankfully, the last instance since we finished the book of. Like mis misconstruing uh, Neoplatonism and Plotinus in particular, where he says, "quote in Thomas, this is page uh, three hundred five." Um, Saint Thomas, with many medieval Christian thinkers, adapts it to the Christian universe as emanating from God, not by a necessary law of being as for Plotinus and the Neoplatonists, but by a gracious free act of loving self-communication by a personal God. Um, yeah, that is a, a stark contrast, which is not rooted in any deep knowledge of Plotinus at all. Um, <laughs> um, so, because Plotinus uh, has pretty much the exact same I mean, there's, there's slight differences, very slight, but he has pr pretty much the, the same understanding of uh, what creation means uh, as, um, as, as Plotinus, as mediated via Proclus, you know, who was um, Plotinus' successor in some sense, um, which is an account of creation as about dependence really you know ontological dependence that's that's what creation means and you see this um what well, actually more proximately i think it would actually be avicenna or ibn um yeah avicenna it would be uh, um who aquinas actually quotes when he talks about creation i think um but in any case um for Aver for avicenna um you know, as well as who, who's obviously following the new places before him, right? Um, th there's no problem in saying that creation is necessary um, and saying that God is free at the same time. Like, there's no contradiction um, between these two things, which someone like Aquinas thinks there is, or at least in, in some places, there's pastors where he, this is where obviously. You know, Thomas like Clark knows Clark go off making this stark. Um, Catholics in general, Christians in general, <laughs> you know, they make this stark 
this contrast between, you know, um, in all for any agent, including God, to be free, he must have the ability to do otherwise, you know, he must choose between options, you know, that's a libertarian dream. I think there are roots to this in Aquinas, but I don't think Aquinas is a libertarian in the modern sense. But anyway, that's another debate. Uh, don't want to distract on that. But the thought about here is just that um, uh, how do I explain? Uh, yeah. Um, when Clark, yeah, Clark is just wrong when he speaks of emanation as some necessary, uh, you know, uh, creation emanating from God as by a necessary law of being. There's no the, the one. There's no law of being that is somehow external to the one. The one is just you know production itself or giving itself, um, as Eric Pudel often puts it. Um, but yeah, that's just the central point I wanted to make. I could put more, but. I thought I'd just make that point first. Now, well, are there some places where Clark uses the phrase emanation in a positive sense? Like, does it, does he think there's a sense of emanation where we can say, no, that that's that's legitimate to equate that with creation? I can see why I I'm can't asking. Remember. I can't remember any. I'm not, I, I doubt it. Be, because, okay, this is, this is, Thomas need to read Albert the Great. <laughs> just got, just going to say that because, because he may, he explicitly argues that, um, you know, not, not only because of, um, you know, his extensive study and use of the uh, Libra de Causis, uh, but, uh, um no for for uh, and i i there is a monograph i i'm really looking forward to reading where it, it discusses this but uh you know uh albert um he he has this 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 metaphysics of flux where which which, which emphasizes the way that that things you know uh are emanated by god in in, in a way uh, I mean, what we don't want to say, right, is like, like, like God is not, when we, what do we mean when you say necessary creation, right? God is not beholden to something other than himself, right? Outside of himself, right? But, but he can be obligated to himself, I guess, right? Would that be one way of saying it that, that he, you know, it's a, it's a freely assumed, right? He's, he's defined his nature in such a way that, that being creator is, is who he is. Right and 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 being being love and being wisdom, right? That's isn't it? So so it's, so the, it it doesn't constrain him to for for him to have a nature, right? And then for from that nature for for his his acts to to proceed, you know, in in that way. Um, but. I, no, I, I, I mean, I, I wonder. It, all this tells me there, there are all these places where kind of like the transmission of some of these ideas kind of became broken. People kind of got stuck in these little polemical, you know, like like for various reasons, I guess, because they were like trying to, you know, juxtapose. Um, you know, they they were trying to counter certain problems, and and so they they drew these perhaps artificial distinctions between things that, that just wouldn't have obtained uh, among some of these, you know, classical and medieval metaphysicians. I think there's a good parallel to be drawn, or I guess a good an, an anecdote that I can sort of provide that uh, sheds, I think, some light on the idea here, like, you know, about sort of, I guess, the necessity of creation with, uh, I was the TA last uh, last year for a philosophy of religion class, very, very basic level sort of thing. Uh, I think it was the second year university course where I am. So obviously not really to the level of this discussion, but there's a sort of comparison I can find where one of the students in the class who's very resolutely an atheist was writing a paper where essentially the, uh, 
argument that uh, he wanted to make was essentially that, well, if God cannot but do good acts, then doesn't that mean that God is in some way beholden to goodness, beholden to some kind of principle that's outside of himself, or beholden to perfection, let's say, if God can only act perfectly, whatever it is you want to say. And he came to me at office hours, and obviously I am not explicitly a Christian in my office hours or anything like that, because it's a secular university, that would be inappropriate, sort of within the guidelines of the thing. But I was trying to just basically say to him, well, you know, you make what you assume to be the best decision you possibly can, right? Like, not, you know, every time that you, you know, you know, every, every time that you try to make these sorts of decisions, and but because you don't have you know, perfect knowledge, you fail sometimes. If you had perfect knowledge, then you, would, you wouldn't you would be beholden to perfection. You would just have perfect knowledge. So you would always make the correct decision because that would be the decision that you would make. And I think the same thing goes here. It's not so much that God is beholden to some principle of metaphysical necessity outside of himself. It's more that he I mean, again, for lack of a better word, we've kind of been going around this. He is that principle of metaphysical necessity. You know, he, if, you know, he's not beholden to it, he's making a decision that if you had the perfect knowledge of God, you would make just in the same way that in this, if you had perfect knowledge, you would be infallible as God is. Or if you had, you know, perfect goodness, you would always perform good actions. And yes, I, I understand that this person had presented a very, uh, simplistic version of the Euthyphro dilemma, Sam. I, I do remind that this person was a second year university student, I believe 19 years old. Uh, and so I should hope that eventually it'll become more sophisticated as uh, time goes on. But that was, I, I think, sort of presented a useful kind of comparison point where, you know, sort of uh, to understand the way in which, you know, God can be sort of beholden in a sense to create, but be beholden by himself in the sense that he has perfect goodness and so that perfect goodness kind of includes a self you know a self-giving and that requires creation but that requirement is not external to god straw it's all straw <laughs> i uh i was just looking up because um uh, brian brought up uh albert the great and um uh actually he and i had uh um discussed um in private albertism which was a uh a, um, another school of philosophy and theology that existed in the uh, University of Cologne in the 15th century. And it was sort of in competition with the Thomists there. And um, I, he, he was asking me what I had found out about it because at one point I had asked about that in a, in a, in a group. And um, I have, uh, so but just now I was, you know, I was looking while he, because he mentioned it, and I was, and I happened to find something that I had not found last time I was looking. I, I found uh, um, a a sort of, but it's in a language I can't understand. Um, a uh, a rendering of Hymeric de Campos uh, Tractatus Problematicus, and that was a um, an old document where he lays out eighteen differences between Albert the Albertist school and the Thomist school. So that's a, so I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I found that lead. Um, but yeah, there's, I do think that there was, um, there is much that uh, I wanted to agree with Brian, that there is much that uh, Thomists um, can learn by hearkening back to Tom, uh, St. Thomas's teacher. Definitely. What, what, what language is it in, by the way? Um, you know, it's, Hang on a second. It's not. It looks. 
It looks Germanic. I don't think it is Germanic. I think it might be um, a related. Uh, hold on. Uh, maybe it is German. Um, okay. Uh, it's being. It's a document that was prepared by someone named Pepin Rutin, who worked on it between 2000 and 2006. Um, while at uh, Radboud University in uh, Nibigen, N I J. Is it, is it in Dutch, maybe? Maybe. That's probably, that's, now that you mention it, yeah, probably, it probably is Dutch. We'll, we'll have to so, look into, but yeah, this, yeah. yeah, Albertism is a crucial strain for, I think, as I said, the German Dominicans and also for Nicholas of Cusa and also for his, his friend, uh, Dennis the Carthusian. Who's, who's really fascinating. Um, uh, I, I've been <laughs> trying to do this thought, it, like what would it take for to reconstitute Albertism for today? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> Most of the people who are interested would, would be coming through Thomism in some way. Right, that's right. But, and so they would be like, but, but, yeah. but no, because we already have Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, and that's and they don't have like you know a, the, the Albertists never had an order like the Dominicans or the Franciscans or anything who was going to go to the mattresses that's for right. them. Um, that's right. But uh, well, may, maybe. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, well, it's, I, it's, I was. Yeah, going... it's keen to speculate about you know what the, what they might what they might have believed and you know, um, and what um. And what what Thomism would be like if we're more informed uh, by uh, his teacher? It, 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 it is interesting. It definitely is. I want to ask a somewhat selfish question because I've heard a lot about Albert the Great, and I've been really enjoying what of Nicholas Acuza I've read. So I'm interested in sort of following this line. Uh, what uh, what what of what of Alberts should I read? I guess like out of the I, I only have English at the present moment, so I might be somewhat limited in that respect. But well, I might be I am. But like uh, I I just out of I'm just out of curiosity. What is sort of the if there was like you know if you read anything by Albert the Great, make it this one. Like what would that be? Well, you know the, it's kind of what there is in in a, like. Uh, so there's this uh, this uh, volume called uh, Albert and Thomas, which uh, I wish it had, you know it, it has just a brief bio and it has his commentary on um, you know the mystical theology of Dionysius the Areopagite. Um, so you know that's that's pretty great. I mean he he produced a, a commentary on the mystical theology. Um, there's a translation of. Um, his book, um, unfor I was unfortunately it's it's not on the because he did an extensive commentary on the Liber de Causis, which I think has not been translated into English uh, yet. But he also has another uh, brief text where he looks at the elements and he looks at uh, different aspects of the universe. Um, as an aside, he was an avid astrologer. And and <laughs> and obviously, and he was just like an amazing like for, he was a pioneer of the sciences. He was a polymath. He was like whoa. I mean, it's just he wrote on the minerals and the plants and the animals, and just you know the heavens, right? You know, and of course they thought that. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think why not in a sense if if you want to. I mean, I think we're recovering this kind of an idea sometimes when people talk about panpsychism or something like that, but you've got, you know, the, the astral intelligences, the planets and the stars, it's not dead, right? Every, every inch of the universe is teeming with intelligence in some way. Uh, it's, it's all filled. There are, there are beings, you know, whether we perceive them or not, that, that it's, it's, it's just, um, there's this scale of being that, that stretches out, um, you know, into vastness everywhere. Um, and, and, and so I know that there's like just a couple of things by him, unfortunately, but, but there's this great, um, I, I could share with you later, but there, there's a, a Brill companion to Albert the Great, which is quite, is pretty, it's, it's a big book, um, with lots of essays about him, which, which, you know, I'd, I'd like to get into at some point. Um, 
and, and there's that other that other monograph where where um, a scholar called Therese uh, Bonnel, uh, and this is in English. She she looks at um, his his metaphysics of of emanation, and uh, it, it's it's very and and kind of partially the psychology of that, which which is very which is very interesting. Um, I would say maybe now would be a good time to, and we can return to some of these other things we've been talking about, but there, there are just all these different things that would be fascinating to, to read together. Um, uh, now, the big one that, that I was thinking, and it, it, you know, it, it, is, it is a really, um, it's a task, right? The, um, the Analogia Entis of, of Eric Shavara, right, is, 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 one, is one text that we were looking at, and as we know, that that was uh, co-translated by David Bentley Hard and uh, Jonathan Betts, and and <laughs> my my friend, who's who's really he, he's really a scholar of uh, late scholasticism. So so yes, um, so take it, you know, for what you will. <laughs> he 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 was uh, he was dishing on Hart's style as being overly verbose and florid in the translation i was like uh, whatever okay uh but but he said no but you should read that book it's a good book <laughs> um and i'm sure it is i mean uh the uh who could accuse I, heart of being overly verbose i'm confused no i i, I know he's well, so I mean, he's definitely he's probably more like he would probably want more concise, you know. He he doesn't like, I, he's not a man. I don't know. <laughs> I've been counted that criticism many times in in uh, in um in blogs where they're uh, taking his uh, book that all shall be saved to task, and they get they tend to um uh, it's very common for the critics of that book to get uh, caught up in a cul-de-sac where they complain about his style more than they address the substance of his arguments. Maybe he should write in a better style so they can get past well, it. Well, maybe, maybe, but I mean, but that's, but it is a, it is a common complaint where they, they, they don't, it's, it's like, uh, it's a problem that he has vocabulary, right? That, that that's some sort of flaw people are just jealous that's that's what it is his english yeah. is great right <laughs> but yeah that's that's um as you know well i mean i i could say a bit about it but do, is there anybody who like has a good sense like they want to say here's what what the analogia entis of eric shavara is like does anybody have like I don't know, maybe you, Samuel, or you know anybody who's like, oh, th this is why it would be fun to read or, or informative. I don't know if anyone here likes continental philosophy, but if you like, if you sort of came to, I, I personally, I did came to theology and uh, in a very personal respect, came to Christian belief through the study of sort of, you know, of philosophy and of those sort of figures. I don't think that there's a, I've not read it in its entirety, but I've read most of the first half before the series of essays that, uh, that uh, Betts and Hart attach at the end. And I don't think I've read a better engagement with phenomenology and the existential tradition from a Christian perspective than the analogy. I think it's, you know, fantastic book. I'm still, I I'm really excited for this reading group because I have I've was floored by it but completely unable to digest it. So I feel like that's is one of the reasons why also it'd be great to read just in general to as a pitch. And if you ever wanted to read it, then I think reading it in a group in a group is probably a good idea because it is a massively difficult, uh, massively difficult piece of writing. Eden, um, how? I also have to go to bed, so I will catch you guys later. All right. Sorry, good night. All right. Thanks for joining. Eden, have you? Um, so your 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 background in um, continental philosophy. Have you ever read uh, William Lupin's Existential Phenomenology? I haven't found anyone else who has. 
I can't say that I have, but the name sounds up my the name sounds up my alley because I mean that's that's mostly what I'm that's mostly what I'm reading for my my doctorate and all those sorts of things. So it's, William uh, Lukeman, you said. W uh, William Lukeman. Uh, hold on, it's it's spelled his last name is spelled in a funny way, so I'm probably mispronouncing it. L U I G J. Sorry, U L L U I J P E N. And um, I I happened to find this in, when I was at um, Steubenville. I, and then, then I had to order it because I found it in the, in the library, in their library. Um, and it, I, um, I, I caught the reference in Voitia. He uh, mentions Lupin in uh, The Acting Person, Person and Act, um, which I had to read uh, in text of Voitia. And that's another nightmare that I won't go into. But um, one of his sources, one of the things, one of the persons that he, one of the writers that he cites uh, the Boitia sites before he, you know, that he, when he, he wrote that book before he became Pope John Paul II, was um, William Lupin's uh, uh, Existential Phenomenology. Uh, he actually, and, uh, this was written in the 60s, I think. So um, when um, Boitia was writing The Acting Person, I think that was pretty much like uh, cutting edge. Uh, and, uh, but it's really, it's very, it's for its size, it's quite comprehensive because. Um, you know, he, he, he basically summarizes the insights of uh, Sartre and Jaspers and uh, I mean, basically, you know, you know all the uh, major existentialists and phenomenologists. There, I, I'm looking it up now, and there seems to be both a book entitled A First Introduction to Existential Philosophy, mm -hmm. and then another that's just simply titled Existential Philosophy. Do you know if those are just two titles of the same book or if they're different? I'm not sure. One is significantly one. cheap. Right, I'm not sure. One might be like a sort of a poor dummies version. I don't know. I, I, I think I saw that that had come out um, and thought, oh, that would be cool too. But I've already read the, the big one, right? So, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I will definitely put that sort of on my list because I definitely want to read like uh, I, one of the big things that I'm doing is sort of like the philosophy of action and so on. And I really want to read the acting person before I get to writing as it seems, you know, a person in act, sorry, those are different books, but both of them I feel like would be a value before I get it, you know, before I get into it. So having something that's in some ways a preface to that would be very nice. Mm -hmm. You can see that, okay. That's what this sounds like anyways, is that sort of, it sounds like this, you know, you said that, you know, it was read prior to the writing of uh, the, of the person in act or acting person. So I'd be, yeah, anyways, in any case, I'll, I'm just kind of going in circles, but I will definitely take a look into that because it sounds interesting. Great. And, and uh, well, I, I mean, uh, Good. Um, well, I'll go, I'll go ahead and uh, end recording for now. Um, so, uh, but if you, if you're watching this video, um, be sure to check in uh, because we are we are going to launch into uh, the next. Uh, um, yeah, the next uh, series of of readings. So, looking forward to that.